It's Proverbs Saturday. Welcome. My name is Jack Heineke, and I'm here for your devotional today, which is from the book of Proverbs. Chapter 1, verse 20, 22, 24 to 25, and verses 27 to 28. Wisdom shouts in the street. She raises her voice in the markets. How long, O naive ones, you who are easily misled, will you love being simple-minded and undiscerning? How long will scoffers who ridicule and deride delight in scoffing? How long will fools who obstinately mock truth hate knowledge? Because I called and you refused to answer, I stretched out my hand and no one has paid attention to my offer. And you treated all my counsel as nothing and would not accept my reprimand when your dread and panic come like a storm and your disaster comes like a whirlwind when anxiety and distress come upon you as retribution, then they will call upon me wisdom, but I will not answer. They will seek me eagerly, but they will not find me. Quite often the words of the Bible are extremely harsh. We all like the idea of a loving, caring, warm, fuzzy God who pours out his compassion and mercy upon us. It's as if we had to go to court for some criminal behavior we committed. We throw ourselves in this desperate moment on the mercy of the court. When we are caught in our wrongdoing, that's the typical response. All too often when someone else gets caught with their criminal actions, we call for the book to be thrown at them. It's an interesting phenomenon where the perpetrator rarely feels as badly as the victim does about the perpetrator's actions. We make excuses. I didn't mean to do that or say that thing that got me in trouble. And besides, I'm really one of the good guys. I deserve a break. They deserve to have the key thrown away to their jail cell. Such is the sinful nature of man. It's not until we're usually facing severe consequences that we may reconsider our actions and the attitudes that led to those actions and then ask God for help. But it may be too late. God is just. This means he holds us in judgment for our sinful behaviors and attitudes. He has a breaking point where he determines that this person who insists on doing things their way, who will not turn to me for help and guidance, will face the consequences of their own making. God longs to forgive everyone, but forgiveness isn't just given, it has to be received. If the person in their own wisdom insists on living life their way and refuses to receive his forgiveness which comes only by accepting Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross, then that person will face their punishment and that is the most frightening moment ever. This is the message of the gospel. This sounds harsh to so many people who disagree with it, but who are we, who he created, to tell the creator that he is wrong? And this is the very sinful arrogance that must be punished and not allowed entrance into heaven. Because if this attitude was allowed into heaven, it wouldn't be heaven. It would be exactly where we all live right now. Wisdom has been shouted in the streets so that no one can say they didn't hear it, that they didn't know of the warnings of wisdom. We've all heard it. And wisdom, as a good friend of mine, Joyce Eltringham, loves, is displayed here as a woman, not as a man. There is a sense of wisdom within women that is not found in men. Men and women, despite popular opinion, are different. Within the wisdom of women is a stable, pure, reliable wisdom that many have trusted and called on and have found tremendous grace, truth, and beauty with. Us guys are a little too rough around the edges. The wisdom of women includes a nurturing, warm presence that is not found in the same abundance in men as in women. But this is within godly women. The wisdom is not of the world, and the women who possess it, they know that. She raises her voice in the streets, and men who seek wisdom listen intently. Who hasn't listened to this wisdom of their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunts? These are the people that many turn to when they need the answers they're looking for. 
And it's not as if men don't possess some of the same nurturing qualities that women have, because a lot of men do. Godly men do. But those who are easily misled may never seek this wisdom. Although they've heard it, they'd rather listen to themselves instead. They'd rather feed their pride by not seeking and using the wisdom that lies outside their limited minds. This is what it means to be simple-minded. They'd rather spend their time scoffing and ridiculing the wisdom of God and find others just like them to reinforce their limited life-taking perspectives. People typically surround themselves with those who agree with them. Instead of having true friends who are willing to challenge them in love, they store up allies who foolishly parrot what they've heard from the other fools in the world. You can tell them by their complaining, and they surround themselves with other complainers who try to one-up one another in their stories of victimhood. None of them actually listen to one another, they just wait to tell their stories in some strange conversation that is nothing but well-rehearsed monologues. And just as they don't listen to one another and they only listen to themselves, they will be judged by God in the same manner. When disaster comes upon them, when dread, panic, and anxiety fills their minds, when their friends are nowhere to be found in their time of trouble, then they may turn to God. If they have insisted on turning away from God throughout their entire lives, they may have crossed the line and it just may be too late. This is a dire, harsh warning, but a warning is always given to heed. It is given out of concern and love. Parents warn their children of future consequences if those parents love their children. Parents who are more concerned with being friends of their children aren't doing them any favors. A parent's job isn't to be friends, it's to warn and to discipline. If friendship occurs, and it can from time to time, then great. But it's usually after enacting loving, thoughtful, purposeful discipline that the child shows even greater respect to the parent. Children seem to instinctively know what they really need from mom or dad, even if the children are fighting against it. I am one of the blessed ones who didn't push God beyond his saying, enough is enough. Like a loving mom or dad, God wants to bless his kids. God doesn't want to enact extreme harsh punishment on anyone for anything. And I believe that if a person turns to God at whatever point in their life, no matter how long they've insisted on their own way, that God is righteous and just and graceful and merciful, to extend that grace and mercy to that person in their hour of need. It can be on a person's deathbed, but it could also be beyond God's breaking point. And the truth is, we don't know where that point lies. If that person refuses the gift of grace, who is Jesus Christ, then there is no other sacrifice made for that person's behalf. It is then that God will not hear the pleas until that person repents and calls upon the name of the Lord in faith. And it's never too late for that. Ask the thief on the cross who entered paradise along with Jesus that very night that Jesus died on the cross. And then ask the other thief who didn't. You're going to get two entirely different destination stories of these two men. Both of them equally guilty. They were caught. They were thieves. And both thieves went to two entirely different eternal destinations. My take on all this is to heed the warnings of wisdom before it's too late.